Well, extra special guest on Cross's Corner today. It's the one and only Matt Gottrell, super sailor, Olympic champion in rowing, engineer as well, I think. Lots of things going on for you, Matt. Did less than engineer, I'd say. <laughs> nice intro, anyway. I was, you had Hodgie on last week, so uh, I, oh, yeah, live, I can't live up to those sort of numbers. But I'm, I'm going to see how much your account of the Olympic final in 2016 um, goes with this. <laughs> I kind of I said to him because I think I've seen you somewhere saying that that was an easy race that final in 2016. Yeah, uh, easy is probably the wrong word to use. Um, yeah. It was one of those races that I kind of when you're in a in eight, for instance, there's so many moving parts and stuff, and very rarely do you ever feel like you have the perfect race. I think it's always yeah, little, yeah. and it's one of those races and one of those days where if it was easy in terms of that, you didn't have to think about it. There's, no, there's never any point in that race where you had to worry what was going on. It was just easy from start to finish in terms of that and because you because you're ahead and you're just watching everyone else behind you. Like you didn't really feel like you were working hard. It's just kind of just doing what you were doing every other day and. Uh, yeah, I remember, I remember getting to halfway and just thinking my major thought was just don't screw it up. I was like, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, having a tip in between Hodgie and Pete was probably not a bad place to be. That yeah, way. that's pretty good. I'm going to ask you a bit more about that race and the stuff leading up to it um, later. But, you know, you're, you're in this amazing sailing city of Auckland where I think the America's Cup has been held several times. Yeah, yeah, no, they, they, I mean, down here, it's, it's yeah, there's a lot of hustle and bustle already, and yeah, it's a bit of a surprise, a bit of a shock to the system, I mean, not being involved in the America's Cup, you kind of hear about it, it kind of comes about every four years, and it's got a huge tradition, and goes back a long time, but I guess in the UK, we've never had it held on our shores for like 180, 170 odd years, so it's kind of never really on the public radar as much, but out here, it's very clear to see that everyone's really into it or all the people are out on the water taking videos and you get a lot of interest just walking up and down getting people taking photos of you when you're just walking to work and stuff like that so it's quite nice it's very different to the uk at the moment i guess and that's you know, that was a bit of a shock coming out of quarantine for two weeks and then kind of seeing this whole other world that exists which is kind of a bit of a distant memory now for most people in the uk but um yeah no it's it's a bit weird but no it's a great city for for yacht racing and they're, they're fully behind the whole thing for people that don't know, can you tell them what the America's Cup is? Oh, so, okay. <laughs> yeah, America's Cup. It was uh, basically a race that started uh, 100, I think it was 178 years ago, something like that. I'm looking into my housemate because he probably knows more about it than I do. Yeah. But, um, 1851. 1851. There you go. Oh, wow. So, um, and the start, yeah, it was held in the first race was held in the UK. Um, and then the Americans won it and didn't lose it for about 50, 60 years or so. So it's kind of turned the America's Cup from there, really. Um, and it's just been yeah off our shores ever since. So the British team has, has tried a few times to, to win it back and never never succeeded. So the last few years, I guess last few cycles, it's been um, held by the Americans again. And the, the Kiwis won it back uh, in Bermuda in 2017 and hence why now the uh, event they're in Auckland. So the winners of the cup get to make the rules, which is a bit of a weird one. So yeah. uh, as a as a defend as a defender, you make the rules for the next cup and decide the boats and the design things. And some things that will be the same across all the boats, and some things that allow us to have a lot of kind of design input. And everyone can be a bit different. So there's all these rules, and there are lots of lawyers involved, and it all has to go through the right sort of channels to get done. But uh, this time round, we have yeah, there's four. Four boats in total, the Kiwis are the defenders, and then we have three challengers, which is the British team and an Italian and American team. So, yeah, it's exciting times, and um, I wasn't involved in the last one when the Brits went out to Bermuda, but hopefully this time we're in a bit of a better shape and trying to learn and, uh, from the last mistakes they made and come back and hopefully bring it, bring it back to the UK. Yeah. That, 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 um, what are the ch Do you have any idea of your chances? I mean... <laughs> it's, it is bizarre. It's, it's a weird sport where you can go into an event, which is kind of you're building up for four years in terms of the designing, the planning of the boats, getting them made, and then putting a team together to then start sailing the boat. And then actually, by the time you've come to racing, it's been four years, and we haven't ever raced any other team in these boats. No, no one's ever lined up. And kind of no idea what's going on. So it's... Uh, you kind of get a rough gauge. You can go and watch. There's a lot of spying that goes on, which sounds a bit is crazy. It? 
Yeah, we've got we had we've had guys in guys based in Auckland for the last two years, uh, in Italy and America, watching the guys go and say in videos of what they're doing up to any, any new equipment that comes out that we can kind of get a head start on. That's a big big thing, and it's the same out here now. You kind of get people following each other around. To, in, on the water just trying to get a gauge of how fast they're going or things like that but until you get on the race course you really don't know wow. uh, so it's a bit it's a big unknown which is very different to the, the rowing world i guess where you get yeah. on the start and you can, well a you can you can only do what you can do and you kind of know it's so race from a to b and you can kind of put it all on the line and you know it's just a physical thing really it's just you against the, the man next to you whereas in, in the sailing world there's so many variables that yeah it's kind of a bit of an unknown, really. And um, you're you're in this amazing flying machine. Is it 75, 75 foot? Yeah. Seventy five foot foiling monohull is the is the kind of the term that's been coined. But it's um over the last kind of ten years, sailing's kind of changed massively with the introduction of hydrofoils and things like that. So it's basically like where it's like an aeroplane wing under the water. So it, it lifts the boat out of the water, which then means your kind of wetted surface area is so small that you reduce loads of drag. Which means you can just go to speeds that they've never really seen before in sailing boats. So the what, last ah like? oh, 60, 70 miles an hour probably eventually. <laughs> it's pretty bonkers. I mean, especially when you have two boats kind of closing together, your closing speeds are nearly hundred miles an hour. Oh so, my god. Yeah, it's it's pretty bonkers stuff going on out there. And um yeah, just the thing is they're so complicated now. They just it takes a full kind of there are people involved behind the scenes to get these boats on the water and functioning and uh, the hydraulics the computer systems required to run them there they're super super complicated and uh, well it just goes to show like with, with Ineos our team uh, teamed up with Mercedes Formula One team and we've had a lot of their resources pushed our way um, so we've got a few guys who work for Mercedes Formula One who have been helping wow. us out and, I mean they, they they're pretty they were pretty blown away by how complicated it was to start off with when they first kind of got involved I mean, they're used to working on a Formula One car, which you think is fairly complicated, but the scale is just so much smaller. And uh, yeah, one of the guys, because we're getting towards the business end now, it's the, it's pretty full on in terms of the development is constantly evolving every day. The boat, and he said it's kind of like a Formula One race weekend, just every day <laughs> at the moment. So he's, he's, I think they're loving it, but it's pretty, it's pretty full on. Wow, that that that's amazing, and. Um... Your your uh, job in that is is grinder, which is a familiar path for rowers. Yeah, I mean, over the years, it's, it's been a, I think the boats have changed, but essentially, you still still need a lot of manpower to get things around the cork. And the roles are slightly different, but it's it's all kind of comes back down to a bit of, a bit of manpower, which is which is great for people like me. And when you spend as, as many years as well, I spent four years with Jurgen's program, it kind of helps. <laughs> yeah. Why, yeah, why is that? Why is that? Why does it help that much? Uh, I think the biggest thing is just um, the discipline and the ability to understand like what the body's capable of. I think, I think it's no secret that Jurgen's program is pretty full on. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of becoming quite daunting when you first get into it. I think it definitely is the biggest thing for anyone joining the British team was I've got, I, it's kind of put up here on a pedestal and it's very easy to kind of go into and be swamped by the whole thing, but it's just about getting through the first year, really, and just making sure you keep your head above the water and don't try and do any more than you have to. Do the, kind of do the bare minimum, really, just to get through. And then after that first year, you can start building on it. I think it's kind of the discipline of knowing that and knowing that just take one session at a time. It's kind of helped me transfer into grinding. It's taken me a long time, to be fair, to stop using my legs and, I use my arms a bit more, but uh, I think the base kind of fitness that we got from that, and just the hours and hours of throwing, and it's definitely transferred. Taken yeah, a while though. That that's because everyone sort of thinks of rowing as an arm sport, which of course yeah. you know, we know that it isn't. It's a leg sport and back sport, really. But I mean, so how come rowers make a transition into grinding, considering they're not using their arms that much? I think it's just it's just your heart and lungs. I mean, it's essentially it's all, it's all the same thing really you still the racing for us is still very intense and i think our races now are looking at about 20 to 25 minutes um so it's a bit bit longer than your rowing race i guess but i mean if you told most people who can row 2k pretty quick could probably go and row a pretty quick 20 minute yeah. test if it so it's all the same really levels of fitness once you get to that sort of standard um and yeah i think it's just the ability to push yourself 
I think it's finding that red line and knowing how close you can get to it and just kind of staying there is something that gets ingrained to you every day when you're rowing is just yeah. learning where that red line is and not going over it because you've got to be able to hold yourself together and still manage to actually get down the course and have some form of technique, I guess, which is that's that's quite a good thing as well as to transfer through it. It's not just about pure just burying your head in the sand and pushing as hard as you can. You've got to be able to think your way around the course at the same time, which is which is quite good. And I think that's the biggest thing when you see all the uh, end every every rowing race, it's kind of like everyone's been holding it together for that two K and it, people people are amazed that just have the exertion at the end of people just kind of collapse. And I think it's because of that that combination of just yeah. constantly thinking and trying to perfect your way to the finish line and technique and just keep it on the ball. And then suddenly it's just a massive release of of energy at the end, which is, yeah, it's, it's a similar sort of thing, I guess. But our races are, are going to be yeah flat out. Basically you enter the start box and then you're just reacting a lot of the time. So are it's you? very difficult to, to rowing where you can just get on the start line and you know, you know what 2K feels like. You yeah, know exactly what your you can set out your markers like your, your start your hundreds you can say oh, i'm going to push off to 500 and this is going to be our race plan i think in sailing you you can have a plan but then you're reacting so much to the other boat as well especially in match racing where it's one-on-one -on -one, that you're kind of you've got to be ready to adapt a bit more and there's a lot more variables so as, as a grinder you want to be able to just make sure there's no excuse from your side of things so the guys yeah. at the back of the boat are saying the boat and making the decisions but um, yeah, it's your goal to make sure that there's, there's no excuse for why you can't get get on the course really. So, are you are you grinding flat out for the whole time, or are you do you have moments of peak activity, and are you grinding like the, for the whole twenty five minutes? Yeah, I mean you'll be you'll be grinding constantly the whole way through, um, but there's peaks and troughs as you go around the course. Um, so, in a, generally in a straight line, um, it'd just be kind of a a steady state kind of quite high-end threshold session, I guess would be, my heart rate's probably about mid-160s during the straight line. Yeah. And then as you come to a manoeuvre, attack or a jibe around the corners of the course or go around a mark, that's when you get your big your big spikes. And so it's a bit different, a bit different to rowing. You kind of have to dip in and out of those kind of really high power zones as you, as you go around the course. So it's something that we kind of can bring into our training a bit as well, because you know it's going to happen. <laughs> so... Yeah. Um, it's basically a 20, 20 minutes, but with kind of 30 second bursts every minute. <laughs> and I what's guess. the sensation like when you're, you know, you're working away and you've got this, this yacht moving at these phenomenal speeds? What, what's it like in your bit of the boat? It's a weird one because I think off the, off the boat, when you get off and you can, we, we do a lot of rotating just to keep energy levels up and make sure that, the big boat still being able to sail to its best potential so you can spend a bit of time on the boat and then you can come off the boat and watch it from the outside i think from the outside it, it looks fairly spectacular but then yeah. when you're in there it's kind of you're in your little in your own little world so i'm, I'm quite cozy I, where, I, where i am i've got a kind of carbon wall next to me and i've got a bloke next to me as well so you kind of just wedged in there still like being in the middle of an eight i guess so you yeah. lose a, you lose a bit of perspective about what's going on around you um, but then you kind of look, might look up a little bit and you just see how fast the water's moving past and the land. And uh, the biggest thing, I think the biggest shot is when you first take off, it's a bit of a weird sensation because you kind of add another dimension. I guess sailing traditionally is kind of very kind of slow paced a bit and you're only used to kind of healing from left to right a bit. Yeah. Whereas you end up with this extra dimension, which is lift up and down. So. It's kind of like standing on a wobble ball or something. Your feet, just your, the floor is constantly moving up and down away from you as the boat's being flown around. That's a bit of a weird one to get your head around. But then the other one is the G-forces in the corners. You kind of... Oh, get, really? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's, it's like... I guess the biggest way to be described would be if you were to... What it feels like is if you were to drive down the motorway at I don't know, 50, 60 miles an hour and then stick your head out the... <sighs> Yeah, that's kind of that's the sort of wind speeds that you're kind of feeling over your head so you try and keep your head down as much as possible so you keep out of that but then imagine if you were just to put your right hand down on the steering wheel of your car just the g-force of that when you go around corners wow. is, no you get used to it i guess it, it kind of wears off so it's kind of we're trying to explain it um but it is um 
no, it's a pretty special place to be and they're very unique because there's, there's only four of these boats in the world now and they're all in Auckland ready to get going. So yeah, there's not many people who have been able to say they've been in front of one of these things. I mean, that's sensational. Do you pinch yourself? Like, can you still believe you're about to go into the America's Cup or is it all in grey now and, and you're yeah, done? No, nah, it's still, still very much in the process of getting ready for racing and stuff. So until we kind of, I think it'd be one of those things. And I think everyone says it, all the athletes speak to about the Olympics and rowing and stuff is it's something that you'll look back on in five years and then you'll be able to say, oh, that was pretty cool, I guess. And it's a similar sort of thing after Rio. I still didn't, didn't really sink in for a long time what actually happened out, out there and I think it'd be the same with this hopefully yeah so put in, into you've got this amazing helmsman Ben Ainsley <clears throat> who must be one of the factors in you know that you you might think you you could win this event um I mean, people who don't know Ben Ainsley just put his his career put him into context the kind of oh. skills that he's got anyways he's I think his tie is the greatest Olympic sailor of all time really I mean he's he won four golds, I think, mean, mm -hmm. I mean, it's pretty impressive in the sailing world as well, which is similar to Rome, where you can only win one medal each at each games. Yeah. So he's, you know, and I think if you watch back some of the races, some of the kind of the places where he's come back to win from and the pressure situations that he's been in and always been able to deliver, it's, it's pretty impressive to watch back even now. And uh, I was lucky enough to race with him earlier in the year with another event we do called Sail GP, which is kind of like a, they used the old America's Cup boats and made them all exactly the same. And this, and that was quite a good racing circuit. That was the first time I'd actually raced with him. And uh, it was just impressive just to see just how he operates. And um, he's, uh, yeah, one of, yeah, it's, his record speaks for itself. He's, yeah. he, very, he very rarely doesn't win <laughs> what he sets out to do. And he's, it's, it's great when you go training, you know that if the boat's all going well and the, and the, the wind's good and the weather conditions are good and he's happy to push it we'll be out there until it goes dark because you know it's, it's just that, that sort of guy who'll just keep repeating 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 until we until we nail it and uh yeah he's very much leads by example in that way yeah now you mentioned sail gp um you know i i heard that you were kind of working doing your job in rolls royce as an engineer and somebody offered you a chance to get into so yeah, it was a well. I mean, when I was in the rowing team, I think I'd always kind of wanted to get back into sailing because I, I sailed before I started uh, rowing, really. So it was always kind of my my hobby and my sport when I was a kid. Um, and the America's Cup was always I'd seen kind of rowers had gone into into America's Cup previously, and I thought it'd be quite a good mould for me with my history in sailing anyway. So I'd always wanted to do that, and um, I, I had an opportunity. I went down. To the Ben Ainsley team for the last time for some testing in 2015, I think. Oh, um, really? Yeah, yeah. And it was just a bit, I think, well, didn't really, stars didn't really align with Rio and the time it would take afterwards for me to get up to speed. So um, I didn't think, I thought that option had kind of disappeared. Um, so yeah, I kind of went about normal life and ended up getting a job at Rolls Royce for a bit. That's pretty and, cool. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it was about through a rowing, through a rowing contact to a guy I used to row with in Nottingham. He helped me out there as well. So that was quite cool. But um, as one of the guys who I used to sail with when I was 17, 18, he was getting involved with this new sail GP, which was just starting up, which was basically um, a spin off kind of from the Amer previous America's Cup. Yeah. Um, Oracle, who were the, the defenders at the time, the American team, they lost to the Kiwis. And uh, Larry Ellison, who's the owner of Oracle, who's kind of the, the money behind the whole thing, he decided yeah. that. He wanted to create his own kind of sports series of sailing, kind of like the Burnley Eccleston of Formula One, I guess, similar sort of thing. <laughs> so he kind of bought the old America's Cup boats and made them all exactly the same and tried to create this racing circuit where it was nation on nation. I was kind of picked that idea and I kind of thought, wow, well, I wasn't really expecting it to quite be as big as it was. And I thought well, it would be a great opportunity for me to go sailing again. And I'd seen these yeah. hydrogen cats and stuff and I thought, Oh, it's, it's a huge opportunity. So I jumped at it and then uh, it's kind of snowballed from there. I did a year with that. Um, and then I met a few guys who had sailed with um, Ben at the last America's Cup through that. They were kind of helping us out. And then, uh, yeah, kind of managed to get my name mentioned in a few places. And then after a year, I got asked to come and join the America's Cup team. So, yeah, it's kind of funny how it's gone 
full circle again, I guess, with back from Rome. But it was kind of always what I wanted to do, and yeah, I'd be very fortunate to get through it. But CLGP was kind of the stepping stone for me to get back into it. Um, it took yeah. me a while. Uh, it took me a lot of time to a put. I had to put a lot of weight back, a lot of weight on actually. I'm probably heavier it's now than I was when I was rowing, yeah. Um, which was unusual for me. I always struggled to do that, and then uh, just learning how to grind really is it's very different in terms of just yeah, the, the muscles are very different, obviously, and and just getting used to getting some mileage in the shoulders and and getting some what good training. 